This video was brought to you by my loyal patrons. Pledge today and you can participate in choosing what video comes to the channel next. Link in the description. Hello all, so as you all may know, the Thomas and the Magic Railroad review was blocked by Sony some time ago. And I have been trying to re-edit the video to fit within YouTube's current copyright guidelines. It has been a tiring endeavor, but it's finally in a place where the video is now unaffected. The review has been re-edited greatly, so if you'd like to watch the original version that was uploaded to the OG channel in January, you can access that via the drive link in the description. Thank you, and enjoy. I was a kid of the 90s, and as was typical for any kid from this era, my childhood consisted of Nickelodeon cartoons, the early Pixar movies, and of course, Thomas the Tank Engine. Who else were you expecting? I was at just the right age when Thomas and the Magic Railroad came out. I remember first finding out about it via the teaser trailer that was shown before a movie at the theater, and my heart stopped. I don't even remember what the movie was that I was seeing. My mind was fully hypnotized by the fact Thomas, my childhood hero, was getting a movie. Thomas and the Magic Railroad hit theaters in July 2000, and I must have dragged my family to the theater at least four times to see it. It was the most incredible experience for a Thomas kid, seeing those colorful engine characters you grew up with on the big screen. It was like validation in a way. A completely gratifying experience. Now imagine getting older, learning more about the world, filling your brain with new ideas and opinions as one does, and then coming back to this amazing movie from your childhood to find out it's kind of... crap. It was like finding out Santa Claus isn't real again. Made me question all of my opinions prior. How could this movie that was such a big part of my childhood, be bad. That was my experience re-watching the movie in the 2010s. I've gone back and forth for a long time on whether I actually like the movie or not, and I think at this point the most positive feelings I have towards it are totally biased from childhood nostalgia. As I revealed in my Thomas Movie Rankings video last year, my overall thoughts on it are that it's just kind of... okay. A very reluctant okay this is a very very flawed movie with some good stuff in it but it makes some of the biggest mistakes anything in this franchise has ever made despite how you may or may not feel about it thomas and the magic railroad was a significant check mark in thomas's history that unintentionally paved the course for the entire franchise following it it's arguably one of the most important hallmarks of the show the first major misstep. I have pushed off for ages on doing a review of this film, as there is just so much to talk about. But as we just finished Season 5 of the Thomas Retrospective, I feel now is an appropriate time as any to talk about the film that that season was made for. This video will be a lengthy, in-depth analyzation of everything regarding Thomas's first cinematic adventure. From a fan who loved Thomas and still does, adored this movie when it came out, and, well, doesn't really anymore. We're going to talk about its production history, the goods, the bads, the long-lost original cut of the film, and the ultimate problem this movie posed on the beloved show. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Thomas and the Magic Railroad. How'd this thing get made? The mid-90s saw the height of Thomas's popularity in all its major markets, including the UK, of course, North America, and Japan. Show creator Britt Allcroft had plans for a feature-length Thomas film as far back as production of Season 4 in 1994. In 1996, she signed a deal with the then-vice chairman of Paramount Pictures, Barry London, to write a script for a film intended for release in 1997. However, those plans fell through when Barry London left the company. The desire never went away, though. London eventually became the chairman of Destination Films, a short-lived division of Sony Pictures, and reapproached Brit again in 1998. Destination Films became the financial backer for the film, with an intended release in 2000. 
Season 5 of the show was produced during this time with the movie in mind. They went all out with this season, putting the characters in out-of-this-world situations such as big storms, avalanches, and supernatural scenarios as a sort of way to show the world what Thomas was capable of handling on a cinematic scale. A sizzler for potential investors, if you will. By 1998, the movie was happening, and production had started. So, what was it going to be about? In the U.S., Thomas had been vesseled to TV via a half-hour block on PBS called Shining Time Station, which was a variety show about people who worked at a train station. A little magical man who lived in the station called Mr. Conductor, first played by Ringo Starr and later by George Carlin, would tell the kids stories about the engines on Sodor. You mean you don't know the story about Thomas, Percy, and the coal? All right, I'll tell you about it. Which would then cut to the Thomas episodes. Shining Time Station was very successful, even winning a Daytime Emmy Award in 1989. Though by the mid-90s, it was overshadowed by Thomas's popularity. It was clear the kids were only watching the show for the Thomas episodes. And the success of the Thomas VHS sales proved that. They even rebranded Shining Time Station in its final years to feature only compilations of Thomas episodes and totally ditch the human scenes. After a six-year run, Shining Time Station officially came to an end in 1995. Despite this, Britt wanted a movie that would link the two shows together. A bizarre decision, to be sure, since Shining Time Station was a show that would be exclusively known by the North American audience. If you lived in the UK, or Japan, or Germany, chances are you had no idea what Shining Time was. Right out of the gate, the movie was doomed to alienate global audiences. But, more on that later. It was decided the movie would focus on Mr. Conductor, and his plight to solve a mystery about a lost magical engine that provided him his gold dust and life to the engines on the island of Sodor. All the while, a dastardly man called P.T. Boomer and an evil diesel engine called Diesel 10 seek out to destroy her. The movie's script went through several rewrites, some versions including characters that never made it to the screen, one of which notably included a whole subplot with George the Steamroller of all characters, who teams up with the evil Diesel 10 to take down the railways he despises so much. Britt managed to snag an all-star cast. Alec Baldwin, who had already signed on to the movie upon taking on the role of the US narrator of the show, starred as Mr. Conductor. Peter Fonda signed on as the estranged caretaker of the magical engine Lady, and Mara Wilson, the child star of Matilda, came on as his granddaughter, Lily. Dee Dee Khan, who portrayed the station master Stacy Jones in Shining Time Station, returned. Michael Rogers signed on as Mr. Conductor's laid-back surfer cousin, Junior. And Russell Means came on as Billy Two Feathers. In terms of acting talent, the movie was stacked. It was decided the movie would be a blend of both human-acted scenes and model engine props as per the show, with the humans green-screened onto the model sets to interact with the engines. A departure from the original show, where the human characters were portrayed by static figures. Originally, the model crew felt that the original Gage 1 props would not be up to cinematic conditions. Fine for small televisions at home, but not for the big silver screen. So, much larger Gage 3 models of Thomas and Percy were built during production of Season 5, and several tests were filmed with them. The results were not as amazing as they had hoped, and they decided rebuilding the entire cast to such a scale would just be a waste of money and time. So, they scrapped the idea and returned to the Gage 1 props we all know and love. The larger Thomas and Percy would later be repurposed to interact with the Jack and the Bat characters in the following season so at least they didn't go to waste. As per the show itself, the movie was slated to be filmed in Shepperton Studios in England, but production later moved to Toronto, Canada for tax purposes, making this the only Model Thomas production filmed outside the UK. All the props and set dressings were shipped over to North America, and many of the show's crew members were flown over, including David Mitten, who returned to direct the model scenes. Upon shipping, several of the show's props were damaged beyond repair, and had to be rebuilt from scratch. Those with eagle eyes might notice how several buildings or ships that were present in seasons 1 through 5 
never appear again in the following seasons. Rest in peace, Fulton Fairy. This movie is notable for being Thomas's first ever dabbles in the world of CGI. The movie features a scene where Thomas travels on the titular Magic Railroad. The Magic Railroad itself was made up of several matte paintings composited on top of each other. Classic filmmaking, baby! Thomas's prop was filmed on a green screen with intention to composite him on top of the matte paintings, but the end result proved unconvincing. So they opted to use a CGI Thomas instead, which gave them much more flexibility with matching angles. CGI and digital effects would go on to be used in the show sparingly after the movie. The movie is notorious for its rocky production history, which all started when the finalized first cut of the movie was screened to test audiences, and it tested poorly. So poorly that the movie had to be changed drastically in the 11th hour. One of the biggest problems was the lack of Thomas characters in the film. There was a heavy focus on the human characters, and investors feared kids would become bored with the movie as they came to it specifically to see Thomas. And unfortunately, at one of the screenings, they brought in an audience that was mostly four and five year olds who loved the movie when Thomas was on camera, but as soon as the live action people were on camera alone, they got very fidgety. Many of these scenes and human subplots were stripped out to give the engines a bigger percentage of screen time. Basically, it was recommended that they pull out one of the characters and make it more Thomas and the Thomas and his friends centric. Most notably, an entire character was removed. P.T. Boomer, the movie's main antagonist. He was cut entirely, and Diesel 10 became the main villain. Snippets of P.T. still appear throughout the final movie, including this cameo on his motorcycle here, and some shots left unedited where he can still be seen on Diesel 10's roof in the chase scene at the end. The removal of this character must have been very late in the game, as he was still seen in the final trailer, and website promotions and books still featured him. An ERTL diecast figure of him was even announced, and was subsequently cancelled. Test audiences took issue with the engine's voices too. Thomas, who was initially voiced by John Bellis, tested poorly, with kids saying he sounded too old. Thomas was recast, and Eddie Glenn took on the role. I'm meeting Mr. Conductor. He's taking care of us while Sir Topham Hat takes a very important holiday. I'm meeting Mr. Conductor. He's looking after us while Sir Topham Hatt takes a much needed holiday. James was voiced by the longtime UK narrator Michael Angelus, but also suffered the same issue and was recast with Susan Roman. You weren't concentrating, Thomas. Lucky for you that the buffers were there. You weren't concentrating, Thomas. Lucky for you that the buffers were there. Diesel 10 had a much deeper sideshow Bob esque voice provided by Keith Scott but apparently it was too frightening for children. Neil Crone came in and provided a more comical New Jersey accent. Help you? You will always need help, because steam engines are cowardly, cranky, worn-out hunks of metal who couldn't hurt a fly. Help you? Huh? <laughs> You'll always need help. Because steam engines are cowardly, cranky, worn-out hunks of metal who couldn't hurt a fly. I'll talk more about the voices later. All of these changes made, the final cut-down movie finally came out in July 2000. And... it flopped. Unsurprisingly, the movie did terribly at the box office, just barely breaking even and critic reviews were mostly negative. Thomas and the Magic Railroad, a muddled and meandering movie based on the popular children's books from England and also the long-running PBS series about Thomas the Tank Engine. Thomas and the Magic Railroad seems so unsure of itself. Both Fonda and Baldwin seem stranded here in a world that never really becomes charming or magical or certainly even convincing. Most audiences were confused by it more than anything, not understanding why it had such a convoluted plot and why it opted to use actual humans alongside the model engines whose mouths didn't move. The lips don't move on PBS, but maybe that's because they have a low budget, but the lips should move. No. I mean, <laughs> either that or the eyes shouldn't move. You know, take your choice. Well, and read my lips. lips. This no. is a bad Oddly movie. Enough, it wasn't a total bust, though. The movie did make its money back through merchandise sales, and it did bring Thomas to an even bigger global audience. 
With a much bigger cultural awareness of Thomas now thanks to the movie, the character became a household name. Though, perhaps not for the right reasons. But we'll talk more about that later. All of these known changes and cut material led fans to wonder what this mystery original cut of the film was like. For 20 years, fans speculated if the original version may have been better than what we got. Well, in 2020, in the lead-up to the film's 20th anniversary Blu-ray release, a work print of the original cut of the movie leaked online, and it answered so many of our questions. Was it everything we dreamed it would be? Well, I'll get to that. It ain't all bad. I know you're all expecting me to tear into this movie and break down why it was a failure. And I will. Don't worry. However, I don't think the movie is all bad. I'm not that heartless. There's a lot of great stuff in it. Some stuff I even appreciate more as an adult fan of the series. Let's take a moment to discuss all the good this movie offers. Number 1. Trains are cool. When the train characters do appear in this movie, it's a highlight. Everything regarding Thomas and his friends and the island of Sodor just feels so right, and everything looks so great on movie film. This is the Thomas I want to see on the big screen. This is what I expect the world of Sodor to look like. It's fantastic. The colors are so vibrant, the sets are big and scenic. That world of escapism present in the TV show is on full display here. The trains steal the show in every scene they're in, as they should. The characters are all written correctly, complete with that entertaining banter that's so present in the original series. Wobbly wheels. Puffy pistons. Thomas, I should have collected Mr. Conductor. James is vain and complains a lot. Gordon is pompous and snooty. You, Thomas, are small. Small, 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 teeny, weeny, weeny. And I, I'm a big blue engine who knows everything. <laughs> Henry is always agitated. Percy is happy-go-lucky, but also scares easily. Percy, you protect those buffers from Diesel. What? And I'll find Mr. Conductor. Me? Oh, why me? Because you're a brave engine, Percy. Oh, I forgot. And Toby is the cheerful, wise old man with a spring in his step. Oh, Diesel won't bother with an old engine like me. He thinks I'm really useless. Even Thomas himself feels pretty correct to me. This is the happier Brit Allcroft version of Thomas than the cheekier Thomas that we're used to, but considering all the growth he's had in the show prior to this, this feels about right. I do love that he grumbles a lot throughout the movie. Bossy sprockets! All that steam has gone to your funnel! I like how he very openly doesn't like Junior. Now, don't look so surprised. I know you haven't seen me since... You stuffed party poppers down my funnel! And he's never too old to put a snobby big engine in their place. But you weren't on time, little Thomas. And you're being bossy, Gordon. <laughs> Everything regarding the world of Sodor and its characters just feels so right in this movie. These are the characters that we grew up with. The voices for the engines are also really on point, in my opinion. Most of them, anyway. We'll get into the human actors in a moment, which is a whole other topic, but the actors for the engines are great. I think the decision to recast most of the characters was a smart one. Thomas, Gordon, Henry, Toby, and Percy are all perfect in my opinion. That's why he wants to find her. Then we'd better find her first! The only one I found weird first watching this, and still feel kinda weird about, is James's. <laughs> Up a bit! <laughs> I really do wish they had kept Michelangelo's for him, as in the original work print. My wheels were feeling worn out with work, so Sir Topham Hatt told me to think about all the ways I can be a really useful engine. Not only is his James voice simply iconic, but it would have been a nice link to the original UK dub of the show in what is a very Americanized movie. Number 2, Diesel 10. Hello, Twinkle Toes. Remember me? Diesel 10 is the best thing to come out of the movie, and the only legacy the movie carries. He's a silly concept, and doesn't make much sense from a realism standpoint, and he looks completely out of place in the regular show, but in a movie with a golden steam engine from the 12th dimension, and flower telephones, and tiny magic men, the diesel train with the hydraulic claw doesn't seem that outlandish. I like how Diesel 10 is kind of a joke in this movie, like he's just this annoyance the engines have to deal with sometimes when he's in the yard. 
Sometimes I don't even take him seriously. I know that's gonna ruin my facial. But when he gets serious or gets mad, he can be pretty threatening. So you've lost your sparkle too, huh? The scene where he tries to back James and Junior into a smelting pit is genuinely quite frightening. <laughs> That's it! There's a good range of character here. A lot of that, of course, comes from the brilliant voice performance. Neil Crone is just having a ball with the role. Inchi, you captured the real me. I mean, that that's beautiful. I could cry. Oh, I see you forgot to bring the oh. sugar. Oh. How careless of you. Say hello to Pinchy! <laughs> Most of Diesel 10's dialogue was improvised by Crone, if I understand correctly. He wasn't meant to be so comical originally. But I do think playing such a silly character as comedic was the best way to take him. And the improv lines are just so funny. Shut up, Pinchy. It's so easy to see why Diesel 10 was the only long-lasting legacy this movie has. While nothing in the movie is ever mentioned again in the show, Diesel 10 continued to make his occasional appearances. Joe Schmo off the street couldn't tell you who Mr. Conductor or Burnett Stone are, but everyone remembers the evil Diesel with the claw. Ow! Pinchy! I hate it when you do that! <laughs> Number 3, The Score Slaps. I feel like a broken record saying the score is a redeeming feature in a bad production. I must have said this in like four videos at this point. But it undeniably is here. Hummy Man's score for the film is fantastic, and it totally elevates what is a rather confusing, muddled movie. I love that the score is totally original and has its own feel separate from the one we know and love from the show, but there are notes and melodies from the original that are incorporated into it. I remember getting all giddy in the theater as a kid when the Thomas theme would pop up. You're a really useful engine, Thomas. I still get chills. Hummy Man spoke very fondly about his work on Thomas, and he has a deep respect for the vision that Britt had. He talks about in his 2020 interview about how the show never played down to kids. The thing that I knew about Thomas, and that and I would say that whether Britt actually told me this or it was, just came out through conversation, was not to play down to the kids. She didn't want anybody feeling like they were played down to. And that the score should reflect that. Number four, setup and payoffs. There's a few little discreet setup and payoffs in the script that I never really noticed until this latest watch. And boy oh boy, was I delighted to discover some of these. The first setup I caught was Thomas explaining buffers to James. You weren't concentrating, Thomas. Lucky for you that the buffers were there. Now see, I always thought this was just a cute little banter scene. Only now do I realize it's explaining what buffers are to the audience before the magic buffers come into play later. Thomas says, That's what buffers are for, to stop engines from crashing. Only for them not to stop him later on when he goes through them into the portal and his whole worldview is shattered. I like how they set up James's sole hang-up throughout the whole movie is his paintwork. Which isn't so hot when you're red. But Mr. C. Red looks so nice against the snow. <gasps> Pretty typical for James. He's also shown to be rather afraid of Diesel 10. And in his last scene, he stands up to Diesel 10. Are you ready? No, we're not. Uh, now we are. And dirties his paint, and he isn't hung up on it. That's a nice little arc for him. I do wonder if it was even intentional, but it had to have been, because they purposely made him dirty for this shot, right? I like how Toby's first line in the movie is, What's important is to stand up on our own wheels to Diesel. And then he does just that later on in his big scene. It's the old teapot! Uh, oh, smash it! Wow. <laughs> this is probably my favorite scene in the movie, if I'm perfectly honest. At five. Did you mean to let the roof fall in? Uh, all the way in. I always mean what I do. This one is exclusive to the work print, but Patch does question this. Mr. Two Feathers, why are there two lines in the middle of this meadow? If we knew the answer to that question, Patch, we'd understand the mystery of this valley. Which then, of course, comes back later when Thomas runs along them through the meadow, seemingly not on rails. 
I always wonder why there was a portal to the Magic Railroad in the middle of a random field. There was no explanation for it. Turns out there was. It just got cut. I get why they cut this, because they talk about P.T. Boomer in this scene, but still a shame. Why all these little setups and payoffs don't mean much in the big picture of everything, what they do show, at least to me anyway, was that there was some level of intelligence put into the script. Wish I could say that about the rest of the film. What the? Why the movie sucks. All right, now let's get into what you all came here for. To hear why the movie sucks. Number one, the plot is a mess. Let's start with the obvious. The plot is incomprehensible. Let me try and summarize the best I can without missing anything important. Sir Topham Hatt goes on vacation, so he enlists Mr. Conductor from Shining Time Station to come and look over the railway while he's gone. Mr. Conductor is magic and a part of a magic conductor family that are like the guardians of this magic gold dust they use to transport themselves everywhere. He's a foot tall in the real human world, and then he's regular sized on Sodor, and I don't explain why. The gold dust starts to run out inexplicably, so while he's on Sodor, Mr. Conductor has to figure out the mystery of why it's disappearing. He phones his cousin Junior to bring him his extra supply back home while he figures out what's happening. Meanwhile, in another plotline, we have Lily going to visit her estranged grandfather, Burnett Stone, but gets lost on the way and ends up at Shining Time, where she meets Junior. Burnett Stone is the guardian of this magical lost engine called Lady. Lady gives life to this magic railway she runs, and its energy fuels the Conductor family's gold dust, and apparently is the reason why the engines on Sodor are alive? Again, not really explained. Lady was crashed a long time ago, and while she isn't running, the gold dust isn't replenishing. Burnett has spent his life trying to get her to run again. With Lily's help, they manage to steam her again, and all the magic returns. Hooray! Meanwhile, in the third plot line, an evil diesel called Diesel 10 has come to Sodor while Sir Topham Hatt is gone, and his goal is to find the magical engine and destroy her, because apparently doing that will cause all the steam engines to die? Again, it's not explained. Wouldn't Diesel 10 also be alive because of Lady? Or is there like a magic diesel that gives the diesel engines life? I don't get how this works. They manage to outrun Diesel 10 and he falls off a bridge at the end. Oh well, nice time of the year for a cruise. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's the plot. This crazy, convoluted nonsense is the plot of this silly Talking Trains movie. This is exactly what I expected to get out of a movie about Thomas. Wait, Thomas? Who's that? Yeah, you might not have guessed Thomas was even in this movie from that summary, huh? Number two, Thomas who? Thomas is very, very strangely not the main character of this film, despite his name being in the title. He doesn't really do anything besides pop up every now and then. In a 90 minute film, Thomas has a grand total of 11 minutes of screen time. A whopping 12% of this film. Thomas's actions throughout this whole thing do not service the plot whatsoever. The only thing he does that has any bearing on anything is take Lily along the Magic Railroad back to Burnett Stone. And that's it. That's his big moment. And after he does it, they just get rid of him. Nothing he does after affects anything. He didn't need to be in the big chase scene at the end. He doesn't really protect Lady or defeat Diesel 10 intentionally. It's not like he purposely caused the viaduct to crack or anything. He's just there cause... He's Thomas, and he has to be. The other trains don't add much to the overall plot either. Like, there's a scene where Harold the helicopter flies by and blows dust all over the engines. Oh, sorry, bro, it's a bit of a dust up. Love to stay in cleanup. Got to go. Bye now. And then it sort of comes back later when Thomas sneezes. Say it, don't spray it, Thomas. I've still got sneezing powder up my funnel. Okay, but like, was that it? That scene just happened for no reason, and it didn't amount to anything. In this scene, the engines just discuss Diesel 10 again, and share no information that's new to the audience. And Diesel is after the lost engine. And if he finds her, I fear that will destroy us all. We already know all of this. You all had this same conversation earlier. Even the big Toby scene, which is a lot of fun as its own little vignette, doesn't lead to anything. 
Diesel 10 announces his plan yet again to get rid of Mr. Conductor. It's time to finally put Twinkle Toe's lights out. This is a job for the boss! Oh, but we already know he's going to do that because he said it earlier. I can do whatever I want. I'll get him too, <laughs> with pitch. <laughs> yeah. Toby traps the Diesels, which seems like a plot point, but they're all just fine in the next scene that they appear in. Roger Ebert described the movie as meandering, and I can't agree more, because none of what happens matters. A lot of the train scenes, while fun because they feature the characters we came to the movie to see, are just like little vignettes separate from the main story. They just sort of exist to fill time, more so than to actually build upon the plot. And this speaks to a much bigger problem. The movie isn't about the trains. Britt Allcroft wanted to make a movie about Shining Time and these people characters, with these talking trains that just so happened to be in it. The work print makes this even more clear, with even more human scenes. It's almost like she wanted to make this whole movie about a girl and her grandfather that had nothing to do with Thomas, but had to use the star power of Thomas to get funding. That's what it comes off as to me, especially after seeing that work print. I'll never understand why Shining Time was such a key part of this movie. The show itself ended five years before the movie came out. Was it Brit's attempt to bring Shining Time Station, the show, to a global audience to get it renewed or something? The decisions are just so baffling. Number three, every human character is stupid. Ironic how in a movie where the humans take center fold, they're the stupid ones. Seriously, every human in the film makes such baffling or unlikable decisions. Like Lily, who chooses to follow a random dog onto a random train instead of getting onto the one she's supposed to, and then is confused why she ended up at the wrong place. Shining time? What does that mean? Or like how Burnett shows no affection to his granddaughter upon seeing her for the first time in years. Hello, Burnett. Stacy. Hello, Lily. Hi, Grandpa. Well, this is awkward. Or how he shows no emotion at all after Patch tells him that Lily disappeared. I'm sorry, Mr. Stone. She wasn't at the station when I went back for her. It's okay, Patch. We'll find her. Don't worry. Best Grandpa Ever Award goes to this guy. Junior just hops onto a windmill sales for no reason. Wh what? Why? This is just like the fun fair! And then he's shocked when that brilliant idea goes awry. Why did he even do it to begin with? Even our most sensible character, Mr. Conductor, after just saying he's running low on gold dust, I'm suddenly having problems with my sparkle. <laughs> foolishly uses his gold dust to teleport into Thomas's cab instead of just walking forward five steps and climbing aboard. Yeah, gee, it's no wonder you keep running out of gold dust, because you keep wasting it, you idiot. You lazy fool. These things shouldn't matter, but I can't help but think about them while watching this. I find it hard to root for any of these people when the decisions they make are so idiotic or unlikable. It's pretty funny when the most sensible, likable characters of this movie are the talking trains, all of whom the movie wants us to take as simpletons. I don't know what eventually means, but it sounds very, very long. Thomas may not know what eventually means, but he still has more brain cells than any of the humans in this movie. Number four, bad acting, bad dialogue. I'm sorry, but the acting from the majority of the human characters in this movie is, is... What do you think? Why do you keep hitting him like that? You're gonna have to have a timeout. On another level. Sometimes it's not their fault. Sometimes the dialogue is just written badly. So much so that it wouldn't sound good coming out of anyone's mouth. Cause a man called Boomer's back in town. And he doesn't believe in magic. Oof. The characters constantly say what they're feeling out loud. Or literally talk to the screen. There's no nuance or intelligence in conveying information to the audience. My universe is in danger. I've got to find more gold dust. I just don't seem to understand about, about magic. Anymore. It's a good thing I like climbing things. 
How could I possibly say that I'm really useful now? Like, we understood that's what he was feeling just by the way he's laying on the ground and looking sad. But he needed to say that line just so it was clear to the audience that he's sad. This is the whole movie, and it just makes it very surface level. Like, I know it's a kid's movie. So expecting some visual, thoughtful, Stanley Kubrick-esque way of conveying information is pretty silly, but that's not what I'm asking for here. All I'm saying is, sometimes, some actions are just best left unsaid. The majority of the acting in this movie is pretty bad. I guess I don't blame the actors for not really giving it their all when this is the material they have to work with. No, you won't, Boomer. Because the magic you refuse to believe in We'll get the better of you. Peter Fonda in particular is just trying way too hard to be depressed. Grandma loved her because I loved her. But she never took a ride on me. I couldn't fix her in time. Like, it's an okay performance, but it's in the wrong movie. Mara Wilson is... Eh, she's fine. She's alright, I guess. She's pretty good for a child actress. You're talking to each other. Ah, for surprise. Alec Baldwin and Michael Rogers carry this movie, and that is not an exaggeration. Beach. Beach, that's it, that's it. <laughs> Alec Baldwin is absolutely overacting, but it's to such a cartoony degree that it's actually entertaining. Where were you? He's chewing the scenery, and you can tell Alec is just having fun with it. Michael Rogers is the best actor in the film, in my opinion. He knows exactly what type of movie he's in, and plays up the ham just the right amount, while still making his character likable. Hey, cuz. You're looking terrible. Why don't we get more gold dust? Because I used yours up. Then, you can go back home, and I can go to the beach. Junior, I want you to listen to me, and I want you to listen to me very carefully. Baldwin and Rogers have good chemistry on screen, and the whole movie just should have been about these two, to be honest. Make it about two brothers, or two cousins in this case, reconnecting after a tragic incident on Sodor or something. Ditch the lost engine, ditch the grandpa and granddaughter plot, have it be about these two guys hamming it up with a bunch of talking trains. Why not? That just sounds like a fun time. You stuffed party poppers down my funnel. Hey, we had a laugh. You did. The movie we didn't get. Now, let's talk about that work print. I talked about earlier that the version of Magic Raro we got was not the intended one. The first cut of the movie had so much more that was removed at the response of the test audiences, much to Brett Allcroft's chagrin. For 20 years, people speculated if the original version may have been better than the final version that was panned. Everyone wanted to believe the original voice actors would have made the characters sound less kiddy. They wanted to believe that this alleged scary P.T. Boomer villain would have made the movie more adult and impactful. They wanted to believe the movie was shafted and would have done so much better if it weren't for those pesky test audiences. In 2020, Shout Factory announced they would be releasing a special Blu-ray of the film for its 20th anniversary. This Blu-ray was packed with new bonus features, deleted scenes, interviews with the cast like Alec Baldwin, Dee Dee Khan, and Britt herself, and featured lots of material from the original cut. Well, thanks to some behind-the-scenes drama that I'm going to choose not to go into, the entire work print of the film leaked online in the lead-up to this release. The treasure trove of lost media. After 20 years of wondering what this mystery cut of the original movie was like, we finally had it. The entire nearly two hour long thing, with all those cut scenes intact. Was it everything we had hoped for? Was it the magical perfect movie we envisioned it being? Well, uh, no. This work print answered a lot of questions we've had about Magic Railroad forever. One of the notable differences from the final cut are all the scenes with P.T. Boomer are intact and reveal he was absolutely the intended main villain of the movie, and Diesel 10 was secondary. The engines all have temp voices, though some snippets of their original voice actors are featured, such as Michelangelo as James, John Bellis as Thomas, 
and Keith Scott as Diesel 10. The movie is structured quite differently, being framed as a story a middle-aged Lily and Patch are telling to their kids. The movie proper starts with the scene of Lily and her mom in the city. There's several alternate scenes too, like this one of Mr. Conductor sniffing a jar of jam in Topham's office. What the hell were they on when they filmed this? And there's a lot of fun technical stuff too, like how they filmed the Thomas and Lady props on a green screen to composite them later onto the Magic Railroad shots. From a technical standpoint, this work print is a real novelty. However, and I'm just gonna say it, the theatrical final version of the film is much, much better. The work print, in my opinion, sucks. Like, I know it's a work print, it's not finalized, and the lack of music and sound makes it kinda eerie and hard to watch. But even if this was cleaned up, it wouldn't work because there's just too much happening. The final movie already had three different plots happening at once, and all that alone is already a mess. Now imagine all of that nonsense, but now with an added backstory with Burnett and Tasha, a framing device with an older Lillian Patch and their kids, and another plotline with a completely other main villain that is trying to seek out the lost engine. It's just too dang much, and the amount of time we spend away from the trains is jarring. We don't actually see any trains until three minutes into it. Britt was notoriously unhappy with the final cut of the film because so much of what she wanted for it was cut out. But where there was negative criticism, I was expecting it because I knew why they felt like that. And if the scenes had been left in, they wouldn't have felt like that. But I think it was for the better. The final film is still messy, but it is a lot more focused and has a healthier mix of human scenes and train scenes. I really don't think much of this work print, but I do think it's a very interesting piece of lost media. It answers a lot of questions we've had about the movie's troublesome production, and paints a much better picture of what Brit's original vision of the movie was from the get-go. Let's talk about P.T. Boomer now. P.T. Boomer, played by Doug Lennox, was the original main villain of the movie. He was a childhood nemesis of Burnett's. I believe the backstory there is that he was in love with the woman that Burnett married, and he's hated Burnett ever since. Either way, P.T.'s main goal is to find the hidden magical lost engine and sell her golden parts for scrap metal. She's good for one thing. She's good for scrap! <laughs> Throughout the film, he's trying to convince people to give him leads or is digging his way into Burnett's workshop. He eventually finds his way onto the Magic Railroad, and is present for the big chase at the end of the film aboard Diesel 10's roof. Now I'll get you, Burnett Stone! Yes! The gloves are off! He meets his fate when he falls off the viaduct with Diesel 10. I don't really get how this is a defeat, though. They show that he didn't die, and he looks fine. PT now knows where the entrance to the Magic Railroad is. What's stopping him from, like, going back there once he climbs out of the ditch? Was this supposed to be sequel bait? P.T. Boomer is just an utterly pointless character, and I think all he does is make the movie more of a mess. His goal is literally the same as Diesel 10's, to find and destroy Lady. Granted, they're for different reasons, but it's the same idea. So, why have him? Why spend all this time setting both of these characters up when they both have the same goal and suffer the exact same fate as each other? Cutting him out of the movie and just having Diesel 10 be the sole villain was a very wise choice. Many lines that were meant to be describing P.T. were reworked to be about Diesel 10 instead. And I find the way they recut the dialogue to be pretty clever, actually. She's safe from harm. Or was. Boomer's looking for Lady, isn't he? Yes, he is. Why does Boomer want to hurt her, Mr. Stone? When we were young men, he was very angry because he didn't want to understand about magic. And jealous because Lily's grandma loved me. So he took revenge. He found Lady and threatened to destroy her. He drove her. He used up all her coal. He made her go too fast. And then he crashed her. She's safe from harm. Long ago, I made a mistake as Lady's caretaker. 
an evil diesel found Lady and threatened to destroy her. He chased her, used up all her coal. He made her go too fast, and then he crashed her. Had P.T. been a part of the final cut, he would have rendered Diesel 10 a pretty useless villain, and then none of the trains would have been necessary to the plot. Diesel 10, in the final, at least provides a link between the human plots and whatever the trains are doing. Another key difference of this work print is that Lily was originally the narrator, telling the story to her kids in the future. Here's Daddy and I when we first met. It all began one rainy day in the big city, just before your uncle was born. Mr. Conductor becoming the narrator was a change made later. Hello, I'm Mr. Conductor, and I'm going to tell you a story about trains, folks far apart, and the magic railroad that brought them together. And again, this was a wise choice. It aligns with Alec Baldwin being the narrator in the show, at least in the American dub. What I don't understand is, why did they film scenes of Mr. Conductor talking to the audience if Lily is the one telling the story to the audience? Ever think about how weird that is? It's not as weird in the final since Mr. Conductor is the narrator, so he's kind of allowed to literally talk to the audience. But in the work print, Lily is the narrator. So why is Mr. C breaking the fourth wall? Mountain? Fountain? That might be something. And only him? I have to find a bellflower. What is happening? I need to make a call. <laughs> Do you believe in magic? Every franchise has its bad movies. So what? So some of the movies of this franchise about silly talking trains are bad? Big whoop. There's bad movies in every single big franchise ever. Thomas and the Magic Railroad being bad is not the movie's biggest problem. It's not the fact the plot is convoluted. It's not the fact that the movie has more to do with Shining Time than it does anything from the show. It's not the fact that it has human characters in it that take up more screen time than the trains. It's not even the fact that Thomas isn't the main character. What absolutely ruins this movie, and the entire Thomas franchise as a whole moving forward, was, in my opinion, the magic element. This shouldn't be a shock to anyone who's seen my videos before. I've talked about in the past why I think this is. Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends is a series that is totally timeless and is held in such a high regard by its fans because of how realistic it once was. This is why kids are drawn to it, why it stood the test of time for over 70 years, why it stood out from its competition of every other high-energy kids' cartoons, and why so many of us still like it all these years after childhood. It was the real-world universe these characters lived in and the way they were written as actual, real machines that needed people to operate them. The stories inspired by real events that happened in the real world are the ones we all remember the most. An engine running off the turntable into a ditch doesn't seem outlandish because it actually happened. An engine and a steamroller facing off and causing a collision didn't seem unrealistic because it actually happened. An engine nearly running off a cliff. An engine falling into a mine shaft. An engine crashing through a station wall. An engine trekking through a flooded track. Engines being put onto scrap lines. All of it actually happened. Thomas absolutely took place in the real world with real life consequences. Sodor seemed like a real place in the world that we could go and visit. The fact the trains could talk was the single oddity of this world. That is undeniably the draw of the original show, and the books it was based on. Then comes along this movie that tells us that the engines are alive because of some magic engine living in a different dimension that gives them all life, and Sodor is some magical land in a bubble separate from the real world that you can only get to using gold dust, and how the engines all can just now drive themselves and don't actually need people to operate them, and people can be put in the craziest of scenarios and not get hurt and how apparently animals and plants have the ability to talk too. That connection, that draw, that suspension of disbelief is now broken. Now nothing matters, because everything is just all magic. Nothing has to make sense now. Things can just happen with no real-world explanation, because magic. This movie breaks every rule of the established universe prior to this, 
And it's so baffling because it was made by the same exact people who produced the original show in the first place. It's times like this when I look at Britt Allcroft and wonder if she actually misunderstood what Thomas's appeal was to kids at all. It makes me think back to episodes that she had rewritten from the original books to actively remove references to real-world places. The people of England, he said, read about us in the books, but they do not think that we are real. So, he continued, I am taking my engines to England to show them. It seems, continued the Fat Controller, that there are many girls and boys who would like to meet you. Therefore, we are all going to the big city far away. Thankfully, Thomas and the Magic Railroad isn't canon. At least, it doesn't seem to be anyway. Nothing from the movie is ever mentioned in the show again. Season 6 came out after this, and it chose to ignore the movie completely, like nothing happened. Mr. Conductor, Shining Time, Gold Dust, The Magic Railway are all never ever a thing again. I think it was a wise choice to just carry on as usual. I would have done the same thing in that position. But Magic Railroad Stain was forever on the show. The general perception of Thomas was totally different after this movie. People just looked at Thomas as that silly kids show with the trains that talk because magic. Oh yeah, that's the show where the trains have faces, and there's like a magic train and an evil diesel train with a giant claw. This overall general misconstrued perception is what doomed the series. The show took a notable dive in quality following the movie, which we'll talk about more once we get to Season 6 in the Thomas Retrospective. I don't like Thomas and the Magic Railroad because it's a bad movie. I can find good things in bad movies. Hell, there are things in this movie that I genuinely like. And there are other Thomas movies that are even worse than this. I dislike Thomas and the Magic Railroad because it fundamentally misunderstood the core appeal of Thomas, and it permanently screwed up the general perception of the series following it. All ironically, at the hands of the woman who made the beloved original show in the first place. Poetic, isn't it? Now, this is the part of the video where I would give you my treatment of the movie. You know, keeping all the good stuff and fixing all the bad. But I'm going to level with you all here. I don't even know where to start with this movie. I think its whole premise was broken from its conception, and there's no real way to make this story work without completely changing its plot and removing the magic elements from it. You know what I would have done for Thomas's first ever theatrical movie? Well, actually, uh, it's been done already, and it's called The Adventure Begins. The Adventure Begins was a movie that came out in 2015 to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the franchise. The movie was an origin story for Thomas, taking the long-running show back to its roots, recreating the original stories of those first books, and giving some background information on how and why Thomas came to the island of Sodor. Where are you from? Oh, uh, Brighton, on the mainland. While it's not a perfect movie, it was a genuine homage that paid respect to the original source material. That's what I would have loved to see here. A cinematic retelling of the first ever Thomas episodes, strung together into one cohesive plot, filmed with the props. A visual and musical spectacle of those classic stories we already know, and a reminder of why we all love Thomas in the first place. Not this. And you could still have those big name human actors involved to market the movie. Green screen them in like you did here, why not? Have Alec Baldwin play a young Sir Topham Hatt just getting his footing in as the railway's controller or something, I don't know. And then use some of that star power to get some big names to play the voices of the engines. Just have some fun with it, you know? And with that, we have reached the end of the video. This was a big one folks, but I really hope it was worth the wait. Thomas and the Magic Railroad was a historic marker for the franchise. It changed everything, and I hope you all think I did a pretty decent job of breaking down why it was the failure that it was. I think it's important to mention that, despite being a failure, despite the dumb decisions that it made, all the cast members have had nothing but positive things to say about Brett Allcroft and working on this movie. 
Alec Baldwin, in particular, seems to remember working on this movie quite fondly. And I just adored Brit. And when she said to me, do you want to do this show? I said, sure. And, and there were a few directors that I wanted to please as much as Brit, because I just liked her so much personally. Which I sure was surprised to hear, as does Dee Dee Khan, Hummy Man, and Mara Wilson. At the end of the day, the movie is made for kids. And if kids enjoyed it, then that's really all that matters. I certainly enjoyed it when I was a kid. It just made some really dumb decisions and just sort of screwed up what Thomas is all about along the way. Not every failure is fully bad though, as even this mess has some redeeming features. It isn't Misty Island Rescue, and I think that's the highest compliment I can give it. Please don't make me watch that movie again. I, I don't think my heart can take it. That's right. <laughs> And so we've come to the end of our movie analysis. Say it with me now, folks. It's time for all of us to go home. Just like Thomas. Well, I hope you all enjoyed that. I actually had a blast making this video. It's been a while since I've worked on a video this big. I want to take a moment here to go over some changes that have been made to my Patreon. I said in the 2023 video that I was going to restructure some of my Patreon tiers, and those changes have rolled out. The cleaner tier is still a $1 tip jar. The $5 fireman tier includes your name in the credits as always, and access to polls for new videos. All polls moving forward will strictly be for Thomas content. Stuff like Sodor's Finest, the Thomas Retrospective, etc. Fireman Tier also now has access to monthly Q&As, which will start in February. This is a text-based Q&A where everyone is allowed to ask me a selection of questions, and I will take a day every month to go through and answer all of them. The $10 Controller Tier has lots of new perks. This still includes everything Fireman has, including the new Q&A perk, two-day early access to all new videos, excluding ones that have to be out on a certain day, like April Fools or something, as well as clips from new videos as I work on them. If you are a controller patron already, you would have seen two clips from this very review earlier this month. So if you'd like to get access to these perks, head on over to my Patreon and pledge today. I, again, want to extend my biggest thank yous to everyone who is supporting me there. You're all helping keep this channel going. That's all from me, folks. Have a magical day, and I'll see you all in the next one.